Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is uh, Russell I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Carl Gables Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I... Haven't found necessary to have a drink, nor have I had a drink since January 25th, 1981. I'm grateful to God and for some old timers, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, who uh, sort of took me under their wing and mentored me, not only my sponsors, but I had incredible sponsors who uh, led me to other men who weren't necessarily my sponsors, but they were, they were there for me. And I learned a lot from these people. I want to talk a little bit about that. And, uh, and uh, this is a great crowd. I was uh, talking to uh, uh, the guys beforehand. I, I think you guys, uh, we won't tell the fire marshal. I think we exceeded the capacity. But it's good to see you guys here. And uh, uh, what did he say? Was the butt kicking last week or something? I thought I was, I thought I was nice. This wasn't, this wasn't the group where I called them all fours. Was it? No. I, I was at Fourth Dimension Club. You know, I was nice. Like, I was on my best behavior. I'm not looking to kick anybody's butts, and I just want you all to live. I want you all to experience what I'm experiencing. Uh, I want, that's what I want to talk about. You know, we're technically on the fourth step, and, and you know, one of the things I've learned about this deal is uh, when the pupil's ready, the teacher appears. Hey, and if the pupil ain't ready, teacher ain't coming, no matter what you say. And uh, the bottom line is if we have, like, 250 people in here or whatever it is, there's 250 stories going out. Because I'm saying something, you know, but you're going to hear what you need to hear based upon your own perception, your own willingness, you know, what you're really thinking about. I mean, you know, we know a third of the people here are thinking about what happened last Wednesday or last Tuesday or that belonged in the front row or something like that. And and you're going to get out of this whatever you're supposed to get out of this. And some people will get something about the fourth step and the third step and the second step. And, you know, I've been to enough meetings and I've talked enough times to have people come up to me and say, I really liked it when you said this. I really liked it when you said that. And they're all talking about the same meeting. They're all talking about different things. And some guys even get it right. You know, they'll tell me I said things that I didn't say. And, you know, the truth is that's just the way A works. It's a mystery. You know, you just go out there and you you, you just do, try to do the best you can to be as transparent and tell your story. And that's all I'm going to try to do tonight. And, and, and I promise you, although you may not hear it, and I never, I would go to these meetings looking to hear one thing and I'd get another thing. And sometimes I wouldn't even get the other thing until it was like two weeks later. I wouldn't even realize, sometimes you don't even realize what you got. You just start thinking about something and say, what was that guy talking about? You don't even understand it. But somehow, some way, you heard it and, it and it sort of like gets fleshed out later on. And and I can assure you that what I'm going to talk to about tonight has to do with the fourth step. Now, what I don't do, and what I used to do, you know, I've been doing this for 31 years, and you know, what I used to do is I used to get up here, and there's nothing wrong with this. Everybody has a different deal. I, I used to get up and tell you sort of like, here, technically, this is how you did it. This is how you do it. And, you know, number one, hopefully, uh, I'm hoping a few things. Number one, I'm hoping you all are into the material. You're reading the big book about Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope to God you're all reading Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. You know, I talked about that last week. I guess that's what he's talking about, the butt kicking. I hope you're reading Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. You know, it took me, I was very fortunate in that I had sponsors that were well-versed and, and uh, anchored in 1935 to 1939 AA. And I'm not going to go into that, but, but there's been some changes in Alcoholics Anonymous in the last 65, 70 years. And uh, I guess in any organization, there's sort of changes. And, uh, and uh, I, these guys were anchored in that sort of like old-time religion. And, and we have a conference-improved material called Dr. Bob and the Good Old Time, which basically says, you know, when you read, you know before every AA meeting throughout the United States, they say, rarely have we said, read from the book that was published in 1939. And the book that was published in 1939 says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And they wrote that in 1939 about the path they took between 1935 and 1939. And really, the truth of the matter is, the, the, best, the best information we had on exactly what that path was is found in Dr. Bob and Good Old Timers, which most people can't even find and hardly anybody ever reads. But I read it, 
Now, I've got to be honest with you. It was maybe, I, I was probably maybe 15 to 16 or 17 years sober before I really got into it. And I, and I, and, 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 and I started really getting into the things it was talking about. And it, 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 it uh, made a great change in my life. And so whenever I, I'm, I'm speaking, I always talk about that book and I always talk about that material. Hey, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe anybody. You know, listen, we all have our deal. And I'm going to tell the story in my own way about my, my own life. But I want you, if you, if you get that book, Dr. Bob, The Good Old Timers, at least you'll be able to look at it and see what they were doing between 1935 and 1939. And then you decide what you want to do and how you want to do this thing. And I just hope all of you get what I've gotten out of this thing so far in the last 31 years. It's just a miraculous thing. I am going to talk about, you may not see it, I'm not going to talk about how you do a fourth step. I hope not only are you reading the material, I hope you all have a sponsor. I hope you all have a sponsor you're working with that you're talking to, that you're sitting down and having coffee with, and you're asking them, how do I do these steps? And, you know, you're trying to figure out how to do this fourth step. I hope you're all doing that. I'm not here to draw you out the chart that's in the book or specifically tell you how to do the fourth step, which is in the book. There's four lists in the book. List of resentments, list of fears, list of faults, you know, lists having to do with the sexual conduct and selfishness and that. I hope, I hope you can read the book and see that and talk to your sponsor about that. I'm not going to go into the technical hows and how you do this deal and that kind of thing, and you should do that with your sponsor. I want to talk about the miraculous transformation. I want to, I guess it's something akin to the promises. I want to talk about what this thing is going to give you, because the way I understand this deal is if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take the steps, then you're ready to do the fourth step, then you're going to want to do this stuff. And if you don't want what we have, and if it's not adventurous to you, it doesn't matter, I can talk them to the cows from home. You ain't going to do it. You're going to just go out here and do whatever you're going to do, but you ain't going to do this deal. You're only going to do this deal is if you're hungering and thirsting at this deal. So I want to tell you a little bit about my life and how my life has changed after coming into Outbox Anonymous and, and sort of like how important this stuff is as far as the transformation is concerned. Um, you know, I guess I came into Outbox Anonymous uh, exactly when, I needed, when the consequences of my drinking came at me faster than my ability to lower my standards. You know, alcoholics are fantastic at being able, no matter how far they sink, no matter how far they get, they're, they're absolutely fantastic at somehow lowering their standards by saying, hey, it ain't that bad. I ain't doing that bad. But when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was, I was desperate for recovery. I was desperate. You know, in the good old days, if you read Dr. Bob in the good old time, it's one of the things you'll see is they used to make these guys get down on their knees before they had to go to the meetings. In other words, before you walked into the meeting, either in the hospital or at the door, they would take you upstairs, and we covered this last week in step three, and they would have you in front of a bunch of men get down on your knees and give your life to God. You know, we got a lot of people, I don't know whether I believe in God, I know that this, you didn't get into the meetings. You know, it was a qualifier. Now, you may not like that. It may hurt your feelings. You may think it's humiliating, but you wouldn't, weren't getting in the meetings unless you did that deal. They didn't care whether you believed in God, whether you didn't believe in God, you were going to do that deal. And uh, I want you to think about this. Those meetings were probably a little bit different than the meetings we have today, don't you think? It was probably a little more intense. You think so? I think so, which is probably why they had the kind of results they had. They, had, they were serious about this deal. They weren't joking, joking around. And Now, I didn't have anybody tell me to get down on my knees. I just got down on my knees at 3 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. Gave my life to Jesus. I was watching some guy. Gave my life to well, which is not a big deal unless you're a Jewish kid from New York. <laughs> and I did that because I was desperate. I don't know how many people have been desperate in here. I know it, you know you don't need much in alcohol synonymous. All you need is desperation. Desperation cuts through a whole lot of crap. You know there's a lot of talking in A, but let me tell you something. You find what you find out. I've sponsored a lot of men. When all is said and done, there'll be a lot more said than done. Everybody's going to really do this thing. Everybody's going to, you know, really, I'm going to really put it 100% into it, you know, for the first week, and then it's forget it. And uh, I'll tell you, I came in here. I, I looked the man in the eye. I said, I need help. I can't stop drinking. That's what I said. I said, I need help. I can't stop drinking. I had a pro I had a problem. I couldn't stop drinking. Anybody ever had that problem before? I'm not talking about, you know, my boyfriend left me, my girlfriend left me, you know, I got the committee working in my head kind of thing. I'm talking about I couldn't stop drinking. You know, that's, that's a, you know what they say? That's, that's an insidious, a horrible state of mind and body. You know, I've recovered from that. 31 years ago, I recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. You know what the hopeless state of mind and body was? It had nothing to do with the emotional stuff or anything like that. It had to do with the fact that I couldn't stop drinking. 
Now, I have a feeling there's probably a few people in here that has that kind of problem, that are alcoholics of the type I was, where they couldn't stop drinking. You couldn't not only, you couldn't stop drinking, you couldn't envision a life without drinking. You gave up. You said, I'm never going to stop drinking. And then all of a sudden, one day, you stop drinking. It's like a miracle. Let me tell you, I don't know what kind of problems you have in your life now, or what's making you feel bad or anxious, but I'll tell you what, as far as, as far as insidious things going, there ain't nothing worse than the I can't stop drinking problem. There's only one thing that rises to second place to the I can't stop drinking problem, and that's when you stop drinking and it's horrible. And you know, that's, that's a, that's gotta be a fun place to be 15 years sober, five years sober, 20 years sober, not drinking and feeling like you want to kill yourself or thinking your life is crappy. Because where do you go from there? You know, where do you go from there? Now, there's an interesting thing about this AA thing. I, now, you guys have been to meetings where they do drunk logs, and there's nothing wrong with drunk logs. I like a good drunk log, and you know, he's saying, then I drank, and then I drank, and then I drank, and then we are all probably capable of doing a drunk log. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. When you go to a meeting and an alcoholic gives like a 20-minute or 30-minute dis dissertation on, I did this, and then I drank, I did this, and then I drank, I did this, and then I drank, and you sort of like see the pattern he's talking about, and all of a sudden you see the connection, you see the powerlessness, you see the unmanageability, you can sort of like connect the dots. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, not, only, it's not only educational, it not only opens your eyes, especially if you're new and you're in denial, you just start seeing things in your life and it starts opening your eyes. It's not only, it's not only that, but it's, uh, it's sometimes even humorous. Sometimes you even say, you ever, you ever go to meetings where people talk about drunk lives? I mean, serious things, you know? I mean, serious stuff. And then I got locked up, and then I got a divorce, and people start laughing. And you, you start, it's, it's almost like funny because it's so, because it's almost comical how incredibly crazy we are, and we just don't see it. But I want, I want to point out, and, and that'll be somebody who's maybe been in A for a year or two or five or six, and they're sort of like telling you their story, what it was like for them, what happened, and what it's like now. And it all sort of makes sense. The whole drunk, the whole drunken fiasco makes perfect sense. Now I want you, I want you to think about something. You know, I was a drunk, I was a drinker. I used to get into all those problems that you guys got into. You know what? I want you to realize that when I was getting into that stuff, when that stuff was happening to me, I didn't get any educational value from it. When it was going on in my life. You know, when I was when I was being stopped by the cops, or you know, when I was when I was kicked out of my house, or when I couldn't stop drinking, or I ran out of money, or all that stuff was happening. When I wanted to, you know, put a bullet in my head, when I when all that stuff was happening, it wasn't like a fun deal for me. I didn't see some. I wasn't, you know, connecting any dots or seeing anything. It wasn't until after I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe years after I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, where all of a sudden. Knowing what I, what I know and learning what I learned, I looked back on the whole mess, the whole mess, and saw how I saw the meaning of it all. It all made sense. It all it all made sense as far as who and what I was, who and what I am. And so I want to point out something to you. I'm going to talk about some things that happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous when I was. Uh, now I know there's some people in here of less than a year. And there's some people here that have less than 10 years, and some people here have less than 20 years and 30 years. I'm going to talk about some things. As a matter of fact, most of the things I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you at least three or four stories, true stories of what happened to me, and these were all within the first 10 years of my sobriety. And what I was doing during the first 10 years of my sobriety is I was doing what you were doing. I was like living my life, just like I'm living my, I was just living my life. And so, and these stories I tell have such great meaning to me in terms of the fourth step, in terms of the tr transformation that you go through, the incredible thing that God will do for you, the psychic change that can happen in your life that's absolutely amazing, that almost leaves the not drinking thing in the dust. You know, you, know, you, you come in here and you can't stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't stop drinking. I thought my life was over. One day, I stopped drinking. A week later... Two weeks later, the obsession left. I stopped thinking about not drinking. I was on, I don't know whether it was on a pink cloud, a blue cloud, or whatever cloud I was on. I'm not sure I ever came off of that cloud. But I'll tell you what, I was amazed. They talk about being amazed before you're halfway done. I was amazed. 
I was so excited about Alcoholics Anonymous. I was amazed that I thought at 31 years old my life was over. And it was the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. And I think that's probably happened to a few of you guys. I was amazed. You want to know what I didn't know? I'll tell you what I didn't know. This is going to sound crazy. I didn't know that I was that, that was small potatoes compared to what was in store for me. I didn't know that, that although that was the most necessary thing to happen, it was the smallest miracle that was going to happen in my life. I didn't realize what was up ahead. I thought this was about not drinking. Everybody, you know, when you first come in, you say, don't drink, don't drink. If your ass falls off, go to meetings, don't drink, and everything. You think it's all about not drinking. I didn't realize, I didn't realize anything about the rocket ship ride, about experiencing much of heaven. I didn't realize what was about to happen to me. Because even though I had stopped drinking, my brain was still, I was, you know, I'm an alcoholic. My alcoholic life seems the only normal life. My old ideas are deeply embedded in me. I still thought like an alcoholic. I still talked like an alcoholic. I still acted like an alcoholic. I still behaved like an alcoholic. I just wasn't using the alcohol, which was incredible. But I was still, but I didn't know any difference because I didn't know about the new freedom. I didn't know anything about the new freedom. I didn't know anything about the new happiness or any of that stuff. As a matter of fact, if anybody started hinting about the new freedom and the new happiness, said, what are you talking about? I didn't realize and, I, and so what happened is, like when I talk about drinking, you know, when you're drinking, you go through that drunk log. As you're going through it, it's horrible. It's terrible. It's a horrible thing in your life. You don't realize how important it is to go through that stuff. And then all of a sudden you come down false and honest and you're a year sober and two years sober. And all of a sudden you talk about all that stuff on the podium and it all makes sense. It's like, it's like an alert. You're almost happy you went through it. It wasn't fun at the time, but it's sort of like great that you can talk about it. And so what happens is... I want to tell you about some things that happened to me while I was out there, while I was doing this thing during my first 10 years. And while I was doing it my first 10 years, and I don't know if you guys realize this, some of you may, at least in my first 10 or 20 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, it was like hand-to-hand -hand combat with the world. You ever get the feeling like, you know, you know you're, you're happy you're sober and you're going to meetings, but man, it's tough out there. It's tough because you're having this battle going on. By the way, it's mostly in your mind. You know, you think it's with the world, but it's in your mind. And this battle is going on. You're going through like a novella. You're going through crises every day. I mean, there's some sort of melodrama going on every day. I didn't need, let me tell you something. I was a resentment waiting to happen. I was judgmental. I was resentful. I was comparing myself. I had a lot of stuff. I had a lot of calls to my sponsor. You know, I can't believe this is happening to me again. What am I going to do now? Also, I mean, life was rough. Life was rough. I mean, thank God I had alcoholics and I was, but you want to know the interesting thing is as I was going through my first year, my first month, my second month, my 11th month, my second year, my third year, my, as I'm going through all this crazy stuff that's happening to me, and this is, this is like not a made up story. This is like my life this is what's happening to me. This is what I'm talking about. This is the stuff I'm talking about to my sponsor. This is the stuff I'm talking about at discussion meetings. You ever been to a discussion meeting? I was a thumb-sucking crybaby for 15 years. I mean, I was the fellowship I joined. I didn't join the fellowship of the spirit. I joined the fellowship of the thumb-sucking crybabies. You know, there was always something going on that I had to whine or talk about or stuff like that. And do you think I saw while I was going through that stuff that this was a great lesson? This was a great thing I was going through. So now 30 years later, 31 years sober, I talk about stuff that I went through, which wasn't necessarily fun at the time. And it all makes sense to me. And it all makes sense in terms of the fourth step and the fifth step and inventory and faith in God and stuff like that. And none of this could, none of this could have possibly made sense in my life unless I had gone through it. You have to go, it's a package deal. In other words, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you're going to have to take whatever you learn in here, as much as you don't even understand what you're learning in here, whatever you hear in here, as much as you don't even understand what you're hearing in here, Whatever you see in here, as much as whatever you don't even understand what you see in here, but it's having some sort of effect on you. You're not even sure what the effect is half the time, and you're going to take it out there. You're going to take it out there into the traffic. You're going to take it out there into the boyfriends and the girlfriends that, you know, uh, uh, disappoint you. You're going to take it out there to the bounce checks. You're going to take it out there to the jobs and the money problems, into the cancer, into all the crap that you're going to go through, and you're going to have to somehow, somehow, and some way, while you're, while you're trying to get through, through the jungle without getting killed, scared as shit, somehow you're going to have to use these tools 
And somehow along the way, some of you guys are going to turn to God instead of turning to booze or turning to coke or turning to some man or some woman to make you feel better, you know, instantaneously or some sort of self-gratifying. You're going to somehow turn to God over and over again and somehow you're going to come out the other end and it's all going to make sense to you. And some of you aren't going to make it. But you're going to have to take it out there on the street. Part and parcel of learning the stuff in here and seeing the miracle in here in other people's lives. Seeing how God's personality works in other people's lives in here. Seeing the transformation of the people is taking it out there and experiencing it in your own life. It's sort of like if you were in college, that would be like the laboratory. That's where you cut out the cut up the frogs and stuff. So that's where you take it out there. And it's going to be tough and it's going to be difficult. And the ones that survive are going to get this thing. And you're going to see this thing. And one of the beauties of this thing is you get to see, hopefully, people that have been hanging around for a long time. And you see stuff. And I saw these men. I hung out with these men. And I saw things in these men's lives that I knew wasn't both. You know, you can tell if you're an alcoholic. Hey, listen, I'm an alcoholic. I'm a great judge. I'm, I'm, I'm judgmental anyway. But I'm given the God-given gift of, 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 of recognizing bullshit. You know, you sit in a bar with your buddies. Some guy at the other end walks in with a good-looking blonde. I turned to my friend and I said, look at that asshole. <laughs> you immediately know he's a jerk. You know how we judge people, but you want to know something in here, that thing used to kill me, you know, look at that phony baloney, look at that stuff, used to, that like to have killed me in here, that kind of stuff almost saves your life. Because I would look at men and I would say, man, I don't know what that guy's got, but I, you know, that guy's not bullshit right, he's telling the truth. I just somehow knew they were telling the truth. I said, how do you do that thing? I don't know how you do those things. And just seeing those people in front, I mean, if this was just a book, and there was nobody if and there was nobody in here with 10, 20, 30 years to show how God's personality, you know, that's what it says in the sixth step. That's what separates the men from the boys. The men are the men according to the standard, they are the ones that, where, that they start repeatedly trying this, this stuff on their life all their life, so they start growing in the image and likeness of their creator. They're not perfect, but they're somehow, some way, the personality of their creator shines through their personality. So we're all a little bit different, but with old times that work this thing, there's some sort of sameness about it that reeks sort of like stability. I don't know about you, but when I was with old timers, when I used to run to these meetings to try to find these guys, somehow I felt when I was with my sponsor, I was with these men, I felt safe. I felt like nothing could happen to me as long as I was standing by my sponsor. The worst things I used to call my sponsor would be the worst thing in the world. You know, I was going to die. I was going to be kicked out of my house. I wasn't going to have any money. Something, something terrible was going to happen. And I'd go up to my sponsor and I'd say something. And he'd say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Don't drink. Come, we're going to go to a meeting. And I just, I believed it. I just somehow knew if I was with, as long as I was with him, I would be okay. Out there alone, I was dead meat. But if I could call my sponsor or be with my sponsor or be with, you know, his buddies, something like that, I was going to because they made me feel safe because it was just something about them. Where well, they were different than the clowns I hung out with in the bars. And so all this stuff started making sense to me. And I want to tell you a few stories. And you're going to have, you don't have to believe it. I'm telling you this actually has to do with the fourth step that you're about to do or you haven't done or maybe you're going to continue to do in the tenth step. You know, there's a tenth step spiritual axiom. And, of course, the tenth step is is basically a continuation of the inventory. And the 10 step spiritual axiom is this. Whenever we're disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with you. Whenever we're disturbed, no matter what the cause, and then they say, what about just five blank? They say, even just five blank. Whenever you're disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with you. Now, of course, as an alcoholic, I don't want to embrace that. You know, what, I, what my old idea is, if I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with you, right? You know, I want, I've got, you know, I want to sit down and tell you a story. I said, I need to tell you what happened to me. And you know what I'm going to tell you about? I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm pissed. I'm angry. I'm mad. I'm scared. I'm, I'm, I'm talking a mile a minute. And you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you. And after I get done talking about you, I start talking. After I get done talking about you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find 15 other people that I'm going to tell the same story to about you. And then after I'm done with those 15 other people, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to go to a meeting. I'm going to go to a discussion meeting. I'm going to tell 20 other people about you. And I'm going to tell them it's not my fault and I'm a victim and it's not about me. It's about you. And you know what's going to happen? Every time I tell that story, I'm going to get sicker and sicker. Then I'm going to surround myself with people that are going to tell me 
that I'm right. It is about you, that you're an asshole. And I have every right to feel the way I felt. As a matter of fact, if I was you, this is what I do, and I'm going to take their advice. And some stupid son of a bitch is going to tell me, why don't I grow up and stop sucking my thumb? This has nothing to do with the other person. It has to do with me. I'm going to cross that son of a bitch off my list. You know, because he's not a good sponsor. He doesn't love me. I'm going to find somebody who really cares about me, who understands me. You know what I mean? Because that's my old idea of what's right and what's wrong, what's good and that's good and bad. And that's why in the in Vision's view it says God will show you how to create the fellowship you crave because you have no idea how to create fellowship because the only person you're looking for is the most toxic son of a bitch in the room that understands you the way you understand you. Because you don't want to change what you really want. You want the entire world to change and think the way you think. To be as crazy as you are and recognize you as president of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> So I'm going to tell you a few stories, and it's, uh, you know, it says in the big book, I'm going to read you a couple of things, and uh, I have, it says, now here's what it says on page 25, we have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Now this is our basic test. I'm not, now this is my opinion, this is our basic test. We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Now you all been to discussion meetings, right? You've all talked to other alcoholics, right? Let me tell you something. They, they, they could have said we stopped drinking. This isn't about stopping drinking. Finding much of heaven and being rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence, which you would not even dream, isn't about stopping drinking. This is about a transformational life. This is about a, a quality of life. This is about this isn't about a, an abundant life. This is about living life. This is about not drinking because you don't have to drink because you are flying high like a rocket ship. There's stuff going on in your life that's unbelievable. You are amazed before you have, you are just amazed. You're amazed at 20 years, you're amazed at 15 years, you're amazed at 31 years, you're amazed at 30, you're just amazed. Because you're on the rocket ship ride, and the drinking is a great thing, you know, and not drinking is a great thing, but the amazement that comes from being on the rocket ship ride and experiencing much of heaven and you know something, if, you're, if that ain't happening to you, then you know what that means? It means it ain't happening to you. You get it? You understand, if it's not happening to you, it doesn't mean it's bullshit. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen because it happened to them and it happened to me. It means it's not happening to you. It doesn't mean it won't happen to you or it can't happen to you, but it hasn't happened to you. And then all the, the only thing you have to ask yourself is this. Do you want it to happen to you? Do you want to be amazed? Do you want to be rocketed in the fourth dimension of existence of which you would not even dream? Do you want to experience much of heaven? Now, some of you in here will say, well, of course I do. But some of you will say, I don't want any of that bullshit. It's true. It's true. Because, you know, they don't, we don't have any filters in here. We come in ready and we come in not ready. Some people want what we have and some people don't even know what we have and don't even care what we have and they just... They just want what they want. As a matter of fact, they don't even want what we have. They want what they had. They want to get all the papers signed and everything done here and do what they have to do and get through the steps so they can go back to the life they had, to the party and all that sort of stuff. And those people, this thing ain't going to work. They're going to have to They're going to have to keep on falling down and slipping and doing whatever they have to do until they get to the point where they no longer want the old life. They no longer want the old life. They want the new life. Because living the old life, the old way, our alcoholic life, is what got you in here in the first place. You know something? And you could be an alcoholic and live an alcoholic life and have alcoholic thoughts and be totally imbued with alcoholism without drinking. Trust me, because alcoholism has very little to do with drinking. Drinking is a symptom of alcoholism. Men and women drink because they like the effect produced by alcohol. They're restless and they're irritable and they're discontented, you know, unless they can get an experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. They drink because they can't stand life sober. Getting laid or not getting laid, with a girlfriend or not a girlfriend, having money or not having money, in the end it all boils down to, I can't stand this fucking bullshit. Let me get out of here. I need a drink. It all boils down to bullshit in your hands because somehow none of it is permanent. You can't nail it to the world. You don't, the wall and you don't have that joy of living. And you're constantly looking for that thing that will make you feel good because all you think about is your feelings all the time. And you're either feeling bad or you're feeling good or worrying about how you're going to feel or why do you feel the way you feel and all you're doing is thinking about yourself. And according to our book, 
It says self and self-centeredness. That's the that's the root of our trouble. We're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking. We step on the toes of others and they retaliate. A hundred forms of fear, self-delusion. Self-delusion, we're deluded. You know what that means? That means if you figured out ten things, ten self-delusion things, ten ways you're selfish, you only got 90 more to go. And quite frankly, it's probably more than a hundred. There's a lot of old ideas out there that'll get you crazy. And you want to know the, the terrible thing? You're about as addicted to those ideas as you are to alcohol, even more. You know, it's just the way you think. You just naturally think that way. You just naturally feel sorry for yourself. You just naturally feel you're the center of the, of the universe. You just naturally want to blame other people. You just naturally feel it is your fault. All the things that lead you to drink and feel crappy about yourself, you don't even have to, you don't have to go to step meetings for those things. Those are the ways you naturally think. That's the way I naturally think about myself. The great fact is just this and nothing less, that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life, towards our fellows, and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that uh, that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we can never do for ourselves. So that's what I want to talk about. And that's also talking about the promises. You know, that's what it says at the end of the promises. He's going to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. He's going to do something. God's going to do something for ourselves that we can't do for ourselves. And it all has to do with getting close to him. And all these steps, all these steps we're talking about, I never want to miss the point. I never want to miss the point. The point is to develop a relationship with God. It says it all through the book. It says, see to it, your relationship with him is right. Great events will come to pass for you and countless others. In chapter 5, after the fourth step, the one we're doing right now, in chapter 5, it says the following. Can you find it? In Into Action, the book in the, in the chapter Into Action. Having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our Creator, and discover the obstacles in our past. It's all about discovering the obstacles. Every step in here is designed to push you forward. So you can have a new relationship with the God, with your God of your understanding. The only thing that holds you back is your alcoholism, which doesn't want you to do it, doesn't want you to go there, doesn't want you to surrender even more. That's why we wind up on the 11th step. That's why after all these steps, we wind up on step 11. Having now had a relationship with God, we try to improve that relationship. That's why they say in working with others, they tell you to burn the idea into the alcoholic's mind, burn it into the alcoholic's mind, that he can get well regardless of anything. It's nonsense to think he has his, wants his job. All he needs, it all depends upon his relationship with God. When I was a month sober, I had a sponsor. I've had three sponsors. Uh, my first sponsor was a guy named Bob Sullivan. He died. He had about 20 years. Died of cancer. And my second sponsor was Joe, Sp Joe Snyder. I think he had about 35 or 36 years, and I had him for many years, 10 to 12 years, something like that, 15 years. He died of cancer, too. And uh, then my third sponsor, John Glenn, is here right now. There's John right there. He's got like 50. So what do you have, 57? Yeah. 57 years. Don't, don't encourage John, you know what I mean? He's a Baptist preacher. I met him in a Bible study. That's a whole other story. We'll talk about that some other time. But uh, he's a good man. And I, I learned a lot from all these from all these men. They all had the same type of character and the same stuff going on. And I want to tell you a couple of stories, two or three stories that happened to me. Before I, within the first 10 years of my sobriety, uh, I, uh, I was sponsored by Bob Sullivan, and at the same time he sponsored me. Now, I'm one of these guys, I picked up a white chip, and I, and I never picked up, I never, I didn't slip. Now, I don't take credit for that. I don't say, hey, look how good I am. I, I mean, let me tell you something. It's the grace of God and the fact that I was desperate and I was scared and I followed these people around. You know, I don't claim that I'm better or anything like that. I know a lot of people that have slipped and come back and have fantastic sobriety. It's just, it's just I didn't, okay? I some, somehow, some way, my sponsor drummed into me, and I believed him. I believed him that if I drank, I probably wouldn't make it back. You know, he would, the first thing he said to me, he says, Russ, many are called, but few are chosen. And he said, you know, you, 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 and, and that's what he would say. He used to say things, Russ, there ain't no problem so great that a drink can't make it worse. And, you know, he would just he would just sort of lead me to believe that if I drank, I probably wouldn't make it back. Or at least somehow I believed, I believed that I didn't have like a second, I, I, that I was, 
I didn't believe that I could drink and, and come back here. I thought if I drank, I was gone. And I didn't want to leave this place, okay? Would that be good, bad, or otherwise, it's just the way it is. And I want to say that. The reason I say that to groups of alcoholics is sometimes I think, and I may be wrong, that alcoholics think that you like have to, you have to slip. You know what I mean? That it's like it's part of the program. Slipping is part of, no, it's not part of the program, okay? Obviously, we love you and we encourage you to come back, but it's not part of the program. You don't have to slip. You don't have to drink. You don't have to do any of that stuff, okay? You know, you don't have to go out and slip. But, you know, as I said, we, he was sponsoring another guy. The other guy he sponsored was a guy named Bobby. Bobby, as far as I know, is sober today. I saw him in another meeting. Now, I want to get this straight. This gets a little confusing. There was Bob, and there was Bobby. Bob was my sponsor. He sponsored Bobby, and Bobby was a slipper. And Bobby used to get... What, what he would do is he would approach a time. You know, he would he had a time. It was like 90 days. And he'd say he'd say like I don't ever heard anything like this. He'd say we're getting to that time. I always I always slip at night. I always drink at 90 days. Like 90 days was his boiling point. He'd be great until the 90th day or the 89th day, and then he was gone. Now I, I since sort of tend to believe that that's sort of like an excuse. I mean, if you want to drink, you can say yeah, then you don't have to take responsibility. It's not my fault. It's, it's the 90 day thing. It's like the devil, you know, it's not, you know, you're an alcoholic, but I'm an alcoholic and I have this like 90 day timer. I'm different. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's just some of the bullshit we tell ourselves when we know that is. But the point is, that's the way Bobby was. And so, and so I'm sitting there and I'm watching Bobby because every time he'd slip, we'd go up, up to bar and we'd pick him up and Bob would put him in the car and get him a, some, some clothes and buy him dinner and then put him to work on his car lot again and do all that sort of stuff. And, he promised to do better, and then do good for 90 days, and then he drank again. And this happened over and over and over again. And I, I don't know how, how sober I was then. Maybe I had eight months, nine months. Whatever the heck I had, I'd seen this happen two or three times. And I was like living. I was like mad. I was like, you know, because I was watching this thing, and this guy was obviously taking advantage of my sponsor, who had like 15 years at the time. And, you know, I mean, this guy was a phony. He was taking advantage of my sponsor. My sponsor was just not bright enough to see it. You know what I mean? And I, and I felt bad. I was protected because, you know, I'm a typical alcoholic. You know, I was just pissed. I took it personally. I take everything personally. No matter what happens. I mean, some guy gets shot in Bangladesh. I take it personally. You know what I mean? You know, I know they do, they're doing this to piss me off, you know? And, you know, there's 10,000 cars stuck in a, in a stuck because there's an accident, in, you know, in, in, on US-1. And I'm saying, why is this always happening to me? You know, and I don't even see the other. This is all about me. And so I was taking it personally. So we're driving up to, to, to pick up Bobby. And as we're going up, and I'm all set. You know, I'm a trial attorney. So I'm, I, I've been thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about Bobby and thinking about this whole thing. And, and I'm going to save my sponsor now. And I got like the three by five cards. I'm ready with the opening statement, the closing <laughs> argument, the evidence. I've got snapshots and blow ups and everything like that. Exhibit A and B. And I'm saying, you know, this guy is full of crap. He's full of, sh he's, he's full of bullshit. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about AA. You ought to turn this car around. You ought to leave him there. The hell with him. You know, he's a screw up. He doesn't care about anybody. He's never going to get sober. And I just go on and on for 20 minutes about how, how, how much this guy's bullshit and how much he's taking advantage of you. And you don't even see it. And you ought to just leave him there and order to drop it and the whole bit. And so he lets me drone on for about 20 minutes. I probably repeated myself about 60 times as we do. And, uh, and then I stopped. I, I took a breath. <laughs> took a breath. I mean, how can you even counter that? I mean, I, I had I had I had a juris doctorate. You know, I graduated with department designers. He was like a used car salesman. Hadn't even graduated high school. You know, I had all my facts down. I was right. I was Alfie right. You know, Alfie. You know what Alfie right is? If you just agree with me, you have to die because you're so stupid. You know what I mean? You just shouldn't be allowed to live. You know? And I was absolutely logically right. And I was. And you know something? I was right. I was right. One time he asked me, he said, Russ, would you rather be right or happy? So what are you talking about? Both, you know? He says, you can never be happy if you want to be both. You never, because you'll always have to get the last word in. you always walk away pissed off. you always make enemies. It only took me seven years to figure that one out. Seven years. I want to be right so badly because I was so scared that people would think I was wrong. I needed to be right, and I needed you to tell me that I was right and that you were wrong. And so I make this big argument with my sponsor, and I take my breath, and he looks at me, and he says, are you done? 
And of course I wasn't because I was now telling the same argument to the committee. You know, because when you get yourself rolling on a roll like that, and you're an alcoholic, you got to then deal with the committee because it's, you're still it's go, you're still having the argument in your head to the fifteen thousand people that are all telling you you're right, you're right, you're right. Like in unison, there's a crowd cheering. You're right, you're right, you're right. You know, and think about the things that maybe you didn't say, or you have to repeat again. So then he asked me, he says, "Are you done?" I said, "Yes, I'm done." He says, "You sure?" He says, "Yes, yes, I'm done." And then he looked at me and he said this. And you know, this is funny. This happened 30 years ago. I remember it like it was yesterday. These are the kind of goofy things that happen. You don't even realize that it's happening at the time. And 20, there's stuff happening to you guys right now that has happened to you 20 years from now. You'll be telling the story about something that happened to you 20 years ago. And you don't even realize the effect it's having on you. It'll change your life. It'll be a life-changing thing. You don't even realize your life is changing. Because we give you a different perspective on things, you don't even realize you have a different perspective. He turned to me, and this is what he said to me. He said, "Russell, are you listening?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "No, are you listening?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Russell, it doesn't bother me like it bothers you." That's all he said. He said, "It doesn't bother me like it bothers you." He didn't say I was wrong. He didn't say that Bobby wasn't doing this or anything like that. He didn't say that. He just said, it, he, didn't, he didn't deny the reality of it, which was clear. He just said this. He just, he just put the spotlight on the real deal. He said, Russell, it doesn't bother me like it bothers you. And I looked at him and I said, how could this not bother you? Everything bothers me, you know what I mean? And the problem was, I wanted everything he had. And he wanted nothing I had going for me. He had had that deal, and he didn't want it, and I didn't know how to get out of it. I couldn't even envision a life without drinking. I couldn't envision a life without being pissed off or being upset, or how could it not bother you? If this happened to you, you'd act this way too. I, I was a victim of circumstance, the circumstances in my life, the shit that was going on around me. <laughs> One day I'm at a meeting a month later with a guy named Al Kennedy. He's up at a podium like I'm up here right now, and he's talking to the group. I've never seen a guy before in my life. He's probably about the same age I am now, 63, you know, 65, something like that. And he's talking, and he's, and he's telling about his life, and he's lifting people up, and he's loving on people. And he's, you know, I mean, I, I just, I'm just looking at this guy. I'm in the front row like you are right now. I'm, like, nodding my head. I'm, saying, I'm watching this guy. I thought the whole world was watching this guy. You know, there were three guys in the back, you know, looking at the blonde in the front row. And I thought everybody was seeing what I was seeing. Look at this guy. This guy's, like, amazing. If I could only hang out with this guy, you know, maybe I'd learn, you know, that kind of stuff. I didn't even know what was making him tick, but I knew he had something. You know, I'll tell you, the best way to describe it is the way it was described in, in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous number three. Bill Dotson, when he was in the presence of Bill Wilson, this is what he says. He was three weeks out of treatment. This is what it says. It would be hard to estimate how much AA has done for me. I really wanted the program, and I wanted to go along with it. Listen, I noticed that others seemed to have such a release, a happiness, a something I thought a person ought to have. I was trying to find the answer. I knew there was even more. I knew there was something I hadn't got. And then he starts talking about some stuff that happened with him and Bill Wilson. That's the way I approached alcohol styles. I'd go to a meeting. I'd chase these guys around. I'd hear Eddie Edwards was talking to Joe Snyder or something like that, or Ray O'Keefe. And I knew these guys. I said, maybe this guy has the answer. I knew these guys. I mean, I was sober, and they were sober. But I was working on a whole different deal than they were. They had something else going on. And so I'm at this meeting, and I'm watching this guy, Al Kennedy. And he finishes off the meeting. The meeting closes. They all say the Lord's Prayer, and he walks out. We're going to go a few minutes over. And... Uh, and he walks out, and I turned to my sponsor, and I said, man, that guy was great. I really enjoyed, you know, hearing that guy. I'd like to hear him again. And he, turned, and he says to me, he says this. He says, same sponsor, Bob Sullivan. He says, oh, he's dying. I said, I, 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 almost, didn't hear, I almost didn't understand what he said. I said, uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about the guy who just did the meeting. The guy who just did the meeting, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm a guy, if I have a hangnail, that's good for three meetings, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, if anything happens in my life, he's saying, I'm dying. I said, no, I'm talking about the guy who did me. He says, yeah, he's dying. I said, the guy just, the guy, Al Kennedy, you know? He didn't say anything about dying. He says, I know. He didn't mention anything. He says, I know. He says, he's dying of cancer. He's got maybe three months to live. 
I mean, I, I watched this shit happen. I mean, I'm telling you, I watched this happen in front of me. I said, he's dying. He says, Russ, he's got three months to live. He never even mentioned. He just did a regular meeting and tried to help other people. Three, four months later, Al Kennedy was dead. Al Kennedy was dead. Do you think that had an effect on me? They talk about vision for you. Do you think that had an effect on me on what was going on with this program? You know, you, you sit, you come in here and you, you want to stop drinking. You want to stop drinking. And I stopped drinking. And I'm whining about everything else that's going on in my life. I'm totally focused on everything else and all the committee. Everything's on, and here's this guy and he's dying. And it doesn't seem, seemingly it's not even bothering him. He's just trying to help other people. and say, what the, whatever drug he was on, I want that shit. You know, I had no clue. You know, and when, when I think about it, he was basically saying the same thing to me that my sponsor had said a month ago. It doesn't bother me like it bothers you. The things that bother you, the things that affect you, Russ, doesn't affect me like it affects you. You know, I'm a different, I'm a different bird. I'm different. I've changed. I've been transformed. No, he didn't say it that way, but that's really what was going on. Seven years later. Seven years later. They say it's not an overnight deal. It's not an overnight deal. Seven years later. I'm nine years sober. I'm on the phone with, my spot with Joe Snyder. Bob had died. I'm on the phone with Joe Snyder. And I'm explaining to him my wife had misbehaved that day. She had spent something she shouldn't have spent. She had said something she shouldn't have said. She was disrespecting me. You know, she was doing stuff, you know, and she was disagreeing with me. She obviously didn't recognize me as the be-all or know-all or whatever it is. And, and I was livid. I was mad. I was upset. And I had a right to be upset, you know. You'd be upset, too, if she did to you what she did to me. And I, and I was telling my sponsor about it on the phone. And then she did this, and then she did that. And I went through my 20, 30-minute diatribe of every single thing she did with specifics. She said this. She said that. She did this. She did that. The whole script, I laid it out for him. And after I was done, and I had already done the fourth step. I had done the fourth step, I had done ten steps, I had done inventory, I had done all the steps. So she continued to do them over and over again. I mean, I had like nine years, you know. And he said to me this, because doing the steps and knowing the steps and having them go from your head to your heart, where all of a sudden you're living the steps, there's a difference between doing the steps and living the steps. There's a difference between doing the steps or knowing about the steps and being the steps and the transformation, which will happen to you over a period of time as you go out there and you, because everything I'm talking about that I had to go through, you know, the thing with Bobby, the thing with Al Kennedy, all that stuff at the time I was going through it, it just seemed like different things that were going on. They were all absolutely instrumental. I needed every one of those things plus more in order for me to have these steps work together and come together for that transformation to happen. Everything that I experienced, that at the time that I thought they were just separate, discrete things going on, not connected, I needed to happen to me in order to change into the man I am today. So 31 years later, I can draw you this line and show you this deal. So I'm telling him all this stuff on the phone. And he says to me this, after I tell him all this stuff, he says, well, do you know why you're upset? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, do you know why you're upset? I said, what do you mean, do I know why I'm upset? Yeah, do you know why you're upset? I said, of course I know why I'm upset. He says, well, why are you upset? I said, Joe, I just, I just spent 20 minutes telling you exactly why I'm upset. Specifics and details. She said this. I said, that. I told you the whole thing in 20 minutes why I was upset. Weren't you listening? I said, sure, I was listening. He says, but that's not why you're upset. I said, that's not why I'm upset. Because, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, isn't it, when you're upset, isn't it clear to you why you're upset? I mean, I don't give a shit about the spiritual axiom stuff. Whenever I'm wrong, there's something wrong with me and all that sort of stuff. When you get upset with somebody, is it not absolutely clear to you why you're upset? I mean, really, am I the only guy? Have you guys ever been upset in the last 30 days? Yeah. When you get upset and mad, isn't it clear to you why you're upset? You, it's so clear. Can't you tell people? Can't you go to a meeting? Can't you go to your sponsor and tell them why you're upset? Well, that's what I did. You know what he said? He said, that's not why you're upset. <laughs> why do I have to come here and put a dollar in the pot to hear that poor shit? You know what I mean? When I know. You know why you're upset. You know why you're upset. I knew why I was upset. I could say chapter and verse why I was upset. And he's saying to me, that's not why you're upset. 
So I said, that's not why I'm upset. He says, no, that's not why you're upset. That whole thing I told you, that's not why I'm upset. He says, no, it's not. Then shut up. <laughs> These guys got power, you know what I mean? Because they got the secret. They got the secret. I didn't have the secret. All I got is a lot of anger. And they got the secret, and they're hanging on to it. They ain't letting go of it. Unless you're big. You got to want this thing. And I could have hung up the phone and say, screw you, I'm going to get another sponsor. But I, instead, I said, I said, well, what would you say? I said, well, you're going to tell me why I'm upset? And then he said, you ready for this? Do you really want to know? <laughs> well, of course I want to know. I'm, I'm like begging for it now. You know what I mean? He said, listen, stupid. That's exactly what he said. He said, listen, stupid. He said, uh, all my sponsors love me that way. You know? He said, listen, stupid. You're upset because you're upsetable. <laughs> But you know something, I didn't realize it at the time. I'm upset because I'm upsetable. I'm upset because whenever you're disturbed, no matter what the cause is, something wrong with you, you know. What I didn't realize it at the time is when he said, you're upset because you're upsetable, he was talking about the same exact principle that my first sponsor was talking about when he said, it doesn't bother me like it bothers you. He says, you're upset because you're upsetable. It doesn't bother me because it doesn't upset me. He was talking about the same thing that was guiding Al Kennedy, who was dying of cancer. But I was wondering why he wasn't upset, because it didn't upset him the way it was upsetting me. He was talking about the spiritual axiom, which they had become. It was more than just not drinking. They were unaffected by whatever's going on in the world. They drew their sustenance and whoever worth they were from and their stability and from their faith in God. It didn't matter what the wife's mood was in or whether the check bounced or whether the boss didn't like them or whether they could get a job and not get a job or they were foreclosing on the house where they had kept. None of that stuff mattered because the thing that they anchored their rock to, what they anchored their life to was not a woman. It wasn't a man. It wasn't a romance. It wasn't getting laid. It wasn't a checking account. It wasn't a car. It wasn't any of that stuff that we talk about in here in the discussion meetings. It was to God and only God, and they were fine all the time no matter what. Because they weren't upsetable. And they first started learning that deal upon doing the steps, all the steps, the fourth step, the fifth step, the sixth step, the third step, the eleventh step. All that stuff went into the amalgam of turning them into the people they were today, which I didn't understand. All I saw, all I saw was the finished product. I didn't see all the steps they went through. I didn't see all the people they sponsored. I didn't see all the stuff they were doing. I didn't see all the crap they went through. All I saw was a finished product, which I couldn't believe. I wanted what they had, the finished product. And I didn't understand that in order to get that finished product, in order to be rocking in the fourth dimension, in order to experience the joy of living, in order to get to the point where you're not only saying, whenever I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, there's something wrong. And you know something? Now, you know, at 31 years or whatever it is, I don't know when. And I'm not saying anybody would lie if they say, you never, you know, it's funny. I'll have things happen to me in my life that you might think are major things and they won't even upset me. And all of a sudden, I'll get into a telephone call with some, <laughs> some guy at, at AT&T about something that's wrong with my phone and I'll, I'll go through the roof or something. So I, I'm the last one to claim perfection, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. The difference between then and now, and you know what happens? You know, my wife, I suppose she's changed a little bit. I mean, probably still, she still does the same stuff. I mean, she's an Al-Anon, you know. She does the Al-Anon test stuff. Whenever I'm wrong, whenever I'm wrong she promptly admits it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, Al-Anon, our ladies of perpetual revenge. But you know something? It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. I have guys that, you know, I sponsor. They follow me around. They'll be at my house, and my wife or my kids will say something to me, and they'll turn, they'll look at me because they're having problems. With, they're having problems with their wife. My wife said this, I'm, they're having problems. They're going to get a divorce. They're going to leave their wife and kids because the way they disrespected it. And all of a sudden, they'll hear my wife say something to me. And they'll turn and they'll say, did you hear what your wife just said? And they'll say, no, what? <laughs> you know, because you know, the way I handle my wife is when I, I know how to handle my wife. I just plead guilty. I avoid the trial. 
You're the worst husband in the world. You know, you're probably right about that. You know, you never do this. I think you're right about that. I just want to know what the fine is going to be. It's usually a blouse or something. You know, I mean, I can always pay the fine. You know. Oh, what's the use? You know, you know, I don't even fight because I don't need to be right. I'd rather be happy. I'd rather be happy than right. And these guys watching me in amazement. How do you do it? How do I do what? Well, how do you put up with that? Put up with what? Put up with what? You know, you're you're actually listening. You know what I mean? It's just, you, you actually think you're taking it personal. You think she's mad because of, you really think she's mad because of me. She's not mad because of me. She's upset because she's upsetable. This has nothing to do with me. I'm just I'm just the biggest fat guy in the room. You know what I mean? I'm her husband. Of course it's me. You know what I mean? I'm here. I volunteer for the job. Anything goes wrong in your life, honey? It's me. I'm the guy. You know what I mean? Blame me. I don't take it personally, you know, because I know, because you know why, and that's the way I act, and I don't get, a, and I don't get into a fight. And 15 minutes later, she's coming up to me and says, "What do you want for dessert?" <laughs> and it's over because I don't have to get into an argument. No, I didn't do it, or I did do it because it doesn't upset me the way it upsets them. And they watch that stuff, and they say, "There's a different way of doing it," but I don't understand that way because my old idea is, as soon as you're attacked, you defend yourself. And I don't even understand why you wouldn't do that. And all this stuff has to do with understanding yourself and why you react and what your old ideas are and how screwed up you are as far as that's concerned and how you think one way, but that's the wrong way. Your best thinking got you in here. Your best thinking got, you think your best thinking is your best thinking. Your best thinking got you in here. You do the four step and you work that deal and all of a sudden you start seeing crazy stuff that you're doing that you don't really understand that all sort of fits in, fits in the amalgam. So if you manage not to drink and get through this deal, you wind up and stuff doesn't bother you. And then you get rocketed into that fourth dimension of existence. You get on that rocket ship ride. Experience much of heaven. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.